So we're really excited about Highlights for High School. We're excited to see how it's used. There was an email that arrived by early this morning from China celebrating uh, this new portal, and uh, it's an exciting new chapter. We can't end the program without a special acknowledgement of OCW's many financial supporters, and without whom it simply couldn't have been possible for MIT to develop OCW, and it won't be possible for us to sustain in the future except for their help. Among our many uh, individual donors have been uh, several MIT alumni who take pride in what OCW stands for, uh, pride in MIT's tradition of sharing what we have with the world. I want to especially thank John Gruber from the class of 1964 and Larry Bierenbaum, the class of 1969, for their leadership gifts that uh, will help have endowed, will help to endow OCW. Um, generous support for Highlights for High School, I just mentioned Charlene and Derry Capsonell and Barry and Stacy Newman, and also by the Lord Foundation. Um, so we want to thank them again also. Finally, MIT is extremely grateful, extraordinarily grateful, for contributions by three organizations who really made OCW a reality. And let me um, mention each of them. First of all, under the leadership of CEO Cheryl Handler, who graduated in 1985, Ab Initio became a major corporate sponsor of OCW in 2005. Ab Initio's substantial financial support has been crucial in enabling us to reach our 1800 course milestone. I want to invite Cheryl up to thank her personally for her contributions, her leadership team, and we're, she's going to I have a gift for you, Cheryl. Oh, no. Yes, it's a little one. <laughs> Please. We're presenting with the gift of thank you so much. I would say not to the surprise, we have actually, well, the gifts are, are this, a globe and a, um, with a plaque on it recognizing uh, your contribution. So thank you, Cheryl. Um, in 2001, shortly after Open Course Wars was publicly announced, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation committed funding to support the development and launch of OCW, and in doing so, really became full partners on this journey. Clearly, OCW wouldn't be what, we, what it is today was it not for the substantial contributions, both financial and programmatic, of these two foundations. Both have awarded multiple grants that support OCW from in the initial startup phase through the publication of the 1800 courses. Both foundations have also been generous in their wise counsel, helping to steer us on a course for success. I want to especially acknowledge the support we've received from the Hewlett Foundation Program Director, Mike Smith, the Hewlett Foundation Program Officer, Kathy Casserly, and Mellon Foundation Program Officer, Ira Fuchs. Uh, we're fortunate to have Mike with us today for the celebration, and I would like him to also come forward. Where's Mike? Okay. Simply stated, we wouldn't be here today celebrating were it not for Cheryl, Mike, their colleagues um, at Hewlett, Mellon, and Ab Initio. Thank you so much. Mike, I, th I thought you had a few remarks. If I could invite you to come up and share them with us. Sorry to make you walk back and forth. Please. So thank you, uh, Susan, and, uh, and thank you, Chuck, uh, and thank you, Ann. Where'd Ann go? She, she leave? Ah, oh, there she is in the front row. She should be. Um, you know, we, were, we ended up working most closely with Ann uh, over the last five years, uh, an extraordinary time, and uh, a wonderful synergy developed, I think, that, that uh, we hope uh, Actually, hope that helped the OCW and, and uh, uh, NMIT also. So I want to thank you also for, uh, from Paul Brest, uh, the president of the foundation, and from uh, Walter Hewlett, the, uh, the chairman of the board, and also from Kathy, uh, who couldn't be here today. And, and uh, she's been the program officer for OCW for the last 
three or four years, and, and hopefully she'll be working with MIT in lots of areas in, over the next few years. 2001 has been mentioned as a, as a date that, that uh, stands out. Um, I have this distinct memory of Chuck Vest walking into my office one day. I, I, didn't, I don't think we'd met before, but you know, maybe we'd passed it in some point. And he said something like, if I got a deal for you, for a measly hundred million dollars, shared with Mellon, you can put, you can help MIT put all of its courses on the web for free. It turned out to be lots less than a hundred million dollars, uh, but that was the that was the introduction. And then we had a you know, half an hour, three quarters of an hour discussion of it. Uh, the idea immediately sparked my interest, uh, and I took it to my president, and he said, "Yes, let's do it." Uh, prepare it for the board. So in April, two months after Chuck had walked in the door, or so I took it to the board. Uh, I was all prepared. I mean, I, you know, this is going to be a big expenditure. We're saying, you know, out year commitments of all sorts of money and, and so on. And uh, so I launch into this kind of, not impassioned, but energetic defense of the, of the idea. And about two minutes lapsed. Uh, and Walter Hewlett said, stop. I get it. Three years ago, I had, uh, I had to figure out what to do with my music collection. He's got this wonderful collection of music. And I thought, well, maybe I should sell it. Uh, or I could put it up on the web and, and uh, people could buy it. Then I said, no, you know, why not? I don't need the money. I'll put it up on the web for free. Well, that's, that's, that ended the discussion in the board. Uh, if the chairman and the and the and the senior Hewlett there, the senior Hewlett representative, said he liked it. Uh, the rest of the board liked it. it <laughs> and the support for this idea since then has come from Walter, and has come from Paul, and it's come from, it's come from the board in, in really major ways. Uh, I don't think either of us uh, that day could have imagined uh, the effect of MIT's extraordinary act. Churchill said, if you have knowledge, let others light their candle with it. But Churchill mashed that quote. He mashed it from Thomas Jefferson, who had said, he who, he who receives an idea from me receives instruction itself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. So there's a one of the first, one of the early mashes around, or at least around this, this concept. Uh, in a recent report, John and, and, and Dan Atkin uh, and Al, Al Hammond argued that over the past six years, there's been a sea change in the attitudes of educators, from a protectionist position with regard to education materials to one of openness, a response to MIT's bold move and taking to heart Churchill's and, John and Jefferson's observations. At the Hewlett Foundation, the MIT OCW grant stimulated a six-year program, which we're now just ending, focused on making open education resources available for free on the web for all to use, reuse, and otherwise modify for their purposes. The MIT OCW grant was our first, largest, and most important award. Our work spans higher education and K-12 in the US, Europe, Asia, Africa, throughout the world. Grants include Harvard Library Collections, full cognitive tutor courses from Carnegie Mellon, multimedia AP and other high school courses, a network of country websites for teachers in Europe, reams of OU UK material, WGBH video archives, physics simulations for high school and college created by a Nobel Prize winner, uh, teacher training materials in sub-Saharan Africa, and dozens of other projects of the same sort. MIT is the only university to place its entire set of courses on the web. But through MIT's example and our combined hard work, there are now over 150 universities that we know of around the world that are following the MIT model of putting open courseware on the web. And we actually followed, to some extent in our funding, the strategy that was mentioned in one of the questions. Uh, that is trying to pick up, not, not having MIT uh, assure the quality of the, 
uh, of the particular areas. But, but picking up areas like public health uh, or medicine or, uh, in the case of Notre Dame, uh, studies of divinity and, and, uh, and ethics and so on, uh, areas that may not have been covered fully by MIT's broad span of courses. And there are lots of other areas like that. Uh, uh, Department of Ed, there's no, there's no school of education that has yet put its uh, materials up on the web. Uh, you, can, you can go down through a whole s series of different, uh, of different areas like that. And we tried to do a little bit of that. Um, but we've, we've actually now moved in a different way. Uh, because taking to heart what, what John and Dan and, and uh, Al Hammond said, we've now begun to change our, our, uh, our set of strategies. We're going to move from funding exemplary bodies of content, uh, like MIT or like the Harvard libraries or, or whatever, uh, to, two, to, to focus on two strategies. One of them is the infrastructure issues that, that uh, Chuck mentioned. That is, what are the barriers to, uh, to getting open education resources up there in a, in a really serious way? Uh, there's the IP issues. There's, you mentioned, I, I believe, uh, the infrastructure issue. So a number of different issues of this sort that need attention and, and need continuing attention by, by a, a foundation or by some other set of funders just in order to keep the pot boiling. But in the meantime, there are all sorts of things going up on the web, and, and so we don't, we're not worried particularly about, uh, about the, the expanse of the web or the wealth of the content or, or anything else. Uh, what we're worried about is keeping, uh, keeping the, the, the sets of networks that are beginning to form alive and thriving. Uh, and if we can do that, we can have this whole area uh, really be alive and thriving itself. The second area that we're focusing on uh, is, to, is to think about how openness, open content materials, open tools, uh, open objects uh, can be used to enhance teaching and learning. And we wanted, over the next five years, and the board has approved this, uh, uh, this proposal, spend roughly $20 million a year. Uh, on both the infrastructure and on this, probably split half and half, uh, taking sets of ideas about how to really improve the quality of learning using openness as, an, as a criterion. So why does openness work in this way? Uh, all these issues have been, been raised here, but one aspect of openness, of course, uh, is that it's free to everybody in the world. This is quite an amazing aspect. Uh, a second aspect of openness is that, that it has unlocked uh, content which has in the past been behind a closed door of sorts. MIT's OpenCourseWare is an example of that. Harvard's library is another example and so on. So those are two examples of it. But there are other aspects of openness and that is the, the use and reuse, which allow people to take and modify for themselves, to translate, to do, to, to do what uh, Dick is talking about uh, throughout, the, throughout the world, where he's talking about indigenous people creating content, but they'll be able to pull down, use, mix, mash the content that exists from uh, the developed world, from MIT, from lots of other places, uh, in order to create it uh, for their own people, for their, their particular purposes. Two parts to this. One is that that's an extraordinary thing because it allows you to modify and personalize and, 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 and alter that, those materials so they can be better used. But the other part of it is that the simple act of taking that material and changing it is an act of creation, is an act of learning. How are we going to take this material and really change it in such a way that it makes sense to us? That's a set of skills and understandings and so on that, that we probably don't have uh, yet in many places, uh, but that will be will grow and, and be uh, be very active uh, over time. So, just to end, uh, I, I I almost feel uh, <laughs> as though I'm repeating what everybody else has said. Um, if we didn't know what was going to happen, if Chuck and I didn't know what was going to happen in six years, we certainly don't, from, from then, we certainly don't know what's going to happen six years from now. I don't think any of us do. Changes are, are really quite extraordinary. 
uh, in technology, in the, in, the, in, the, in this growing kind of youth uh, understanding of how to manipulate and change and modify and so on that we, we talked about in, the, uh, in the, the, the session a few minutes ago. Um, my grandchildren, my children are too old to be fully in this, in this generation. My grandchildren are, they're doing all the things that everybody mentioned here. Uh, and they're teaching, actually. Uh, one of my sons, who is a techie, uh, and he, when, he, when he comes and visits uh, his, his nephew, uh, his nephew is in there working away, showing him something that, that uh, he hasn't seen before, which is a, you know, it's kind of a wonderful cross-generational aspect. Chuck had, had, uh, has one vision, which is worth anybody looking at if they haven't looked at it, that vision of the meta-university. Um, and interestingly, in the last week, we've heard from two different parties that they're trying to figure out how to implement the meta-university. So, and you probably don't even know about it. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a group in Australia and there's a group in Canada that are, that are thinking about this. So, so the world is, is changing underneath us. Um, it's changing very fast underneath us. Just another example of that is that I believe three years ago, Dick Rowe had probably never heard of OpenCourseWare, or if he had, he, he wasn't quite sure what it was. Uh, he is now very actively, very deep into, into these things. Uh, and so I, I wish everybody well. I want to thank you again. It's been a great ride for the last six years, uh, and I'm sure it'll be a great ride for the next six years. Thank you. So I have a couple of, of brief administrative things. I know there are members of the press in the audience. Those of you who wish to stay and meet with one of uh, our in, in the press room to get a further briefing on uh, highlights for high school or other aspects of open courseware, if you'll just come down to that sign over there uh, when we when we conclude, uh, Steve Carson of the Open Courseware staff will lead you to the media room and you can ask questions and have further discussion. The second thing is to thank all of you for coming here. Uh, it, it is greatly appreciated and, and trying to convey the excitement. And the last is, before we go, uh, is there will be a reception outside after immediately following the closing of these ceremonies. So let me end with the following more personalized note. Um, I've spent all my, what my wife claims is a very late adolescence and all my adult life here at MIT. And I'm acutely aware this is a sea of excellence where great ideas formed by great people happen. And yet, even within that baseline of, of extraordinary excellence, a few things over the course of a decade or two decades emerge from an institution like MIT to have extraordinary impact. And I'm willing to wager uh, that open courseware, when the history of the early part of MIT's history uh, is written and we think about the early part of this 21st century and ask, what are the extraordinary things MIT did in that period. In the same way when we look uh, in the 1940s about the development of radar and the development of artificial intelligence and a few other signature events in MIT's history, in that same way, it's my view that open courseware will be on that very short list of, an, of things that even in an illustrious history of an institution stand out. And so I'm going to try to remember this moment and remember this event. I'd like to thank you for all com for coming, and please join us for reception. Thank you. Thank you.